now to present uh, Rafi Malach from the Weizmann Institute, Department of Neurobiology. Uh, Rafi graduated a uh, long time ago at Berkeley in uh, optical physiology or physiology of optics, how would you call it? Optics. Okay, and then uh, moved for the postdoc in the MIT in neuroanatomy and actually at the time that I met uh, Rafi first, he was still doing neuroanatomy. And I remember uh, people were questioning why he was he moving to a new field that he had no idea on it, uh, MRI and his use. Uh, uh, so today we'll see the outcome of it. So we're happy to have you here and the crowd is yours. Great, thanks for the invitation. And uh, I have to admit it's my first uh, lecture by Zoom, so I apologize in advance if I will be some glitches, I hope you do well. Feel free to ask questions, uh, uh, we'll see how it works. Um, so the topic I would like to discuss uh, today, and it's quite relevant to the corona isolation, is free behavior. Uh, our ability to behave freely is a, really an essential aspect of uh, human behavior. People are willing to go to war to become, to be able to exercise the freedom. Uh, it's a very, very uh, important aspect of our life. And um, a very important uh, characteristic of, uh, of uh, free behavior is that it is very, very diverse. We find we are able to act freely in many, almost all domains and all possible aspects of life. We can perform music in a freestyle, like in jazz. We can have free movement, free dance styles. Um, we can close our eyes and freely imagine any object we want, from possible object, pink elephants, to beautiful sunsets. Uh, uh, so we we'll really uh, have a, a great diversity of abilities. And most importantly, perhaps, a, a very, very essential aspect of human behavior, namely creativity, is strictly an, a, a subset of free behavior. You cannot imagine being original and creative by a controlled behavior. You must act freely in order to freely come up with ideas and, and concepts. And this is actually creative behavior is actually the dynamo of uh, progress in science, technology, culture, and so forth. So we are talking about a very, very diverse and important aspect of human behavior. And the question I would like to discuss today is what is the neuronal mechanism in the brain? If there is such a mechanism, if there is what it could be, that is actually underlying our ability to behave freely. And before we, we, we dive, I mean, we slide into philosophical argument with free behavior. There's some noise in the background. Is it coming from me? Anyway, so before we slide into problems of definition, if free behavior is even possible in, the, in, a, in principle or philosophical argument, I want for the sake of this talk to make a very specific operational definition of what, what, what I mean and what we study when we talk about free behavior. And the definition is very simple. A free behavior is a behavior that is not fully determined by an external instruction. And I immediately will give an example from an experiment that we conducted with the Otten Brodade here in our lab that illustrate what I mean by free behavior. You line the magnet in the MRI scanner and you are giving a task, name, give names of tools, okay? Uh, so you line the magnet and you think about names of tools and uh, Okay, you know, at first you might have few names that are directly associatively linked to the word, to the category of tools, but gradually you sort of have to explore your mind and think, okay, name of a tool, name of a tool, aha, hammer, aha, screwdriver. And this, this phenomenon that suddenly you have this aha experience of freely, spontaneously emerging the name of a tool, I will consider a, an example of free behavior. Notice that it's not totally free. You were given the instruction to come up with names of tools, but the specific exemplar, screwdriver, hammer, 
is not determined by the instruction, it is determined by some process that happens inside your brain. And let's contrast that with a control experiment where you are given the specific instruction to say a specific name in your world. Let's say to say hammer, 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 or rest, rest, rest. Every time you hear a beep, this I will call a determined or controlled uh, behavior. You don't have any freedom here to choose whatever name you want to come. You have to repeat the name that you were given in the instruction. So I hope this illustrates what do we mean by free versus controlled behavior. And the question I would like to ask is, what is the neural me mechanism that underlies our ability to freely come up with different names and different ideas? Uh, I will be talking about, and very briefly uh, 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 summarize here, I'll be talking about different ways of measuring from the human brain. Two ways will be invasive ways in which we, these are experiments conducted only in patients where in the, in the course of a surgical um, exploration for epileptic focus, the neurosurgeon strictly for clinical purposes can place electrode inside the brain of the patient. And this electrode can record sometimes individual neurons so we can actually measure firing rate of individual neurons or groups of neurons, local field potential, we can, where we can get high frequencies that are indexing the firing rate. And in addition, I'll show data from fMRI. This is non-invasive done uh, students at the Weizmann Institute where we are measuring old fMRI. And I will move uh, freely between these different techniques and I'll call them activity. But I'll mention when we are getting them from single neurons and when we are getting them from fMRI. So these are the methods I'll be using. And the question I want to ask today is what is the neural mechanism that may underlie free and creative behavior in the human brain. And if we, we try to think what could be a mechanism like that, we have immediately can think about two requirements that you want from such a, such a, a mechanism. The first one relates to the fact that I mentioned before, the free behavior is very diverse. In fact, I cannot think of any function or task that you cannot perform freely. So it, in, a free behavior involves all possible neuronal networks from vision to music to motion to thinking and so forth. So we will expect the neuronal signal to be very ubiquitous. It should be exp um, found across the entire pro uh, cortex, the entire brain. So this is one aspect that we expect from such a signal that is driving free behavior. It must be engaging every possible network that you think about it. The second requirement we want from such a signal is that it should be spontaneous. The whole point about free behavior is that it should not be driven by an outside instruction. It should be coming from, so to speak, from inside spontaneously. So naturally we'll expect the signal to be spont emerging spontaneously, not as a result of an outside uh, instruction. And in fact, if you think about it, we were studying it in the fMRI community, such a signal for many years, and we just uh, uh, called it by a different name. And I would like to propose that this signal, this activity that we were being studying and we were calling it spontaneous or resting state fluctuations is the mechanism that is driving free behavior. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with what, what this phenomena resting state fluctuations are, I brought here an example from a simple experiment where we placed a, a subject in the fMRI scanner. The subject is asked to simply rest without doing any task, close their eyes. We have quieting earphones, so it's not exposed to any obvious sensory or uh, stimulation or instruction. And let's see what happens in the brain of such a subject when it's completely resting, not but uh, performing any particular uh, task. Okay, this is complete rest, dark room, no stimulation. Sorry, question? Okay, so let's notice uh, several aspects of what you see. What you see here in, in yellow and orange are activations of the brain measured with fMRI. First of all, notice that this fluctuation that you see coming and going are exceedingly slow. 
We accelerated the movie three times so you'll not get bored. It takes seconds to develop. They are not something that comes with like typical task-related activation that is within milliseconds. These are seconds in terms of the uh, time scale. The second thing you probably notice, they occur all over the brain. You don't find any point in the cortex that is not participating in this spontaneous resting state fluctuation. And the final thing you'll notice, they are organizing structures. We call them networks. Uh, they are not sort of random noise phenomena, but this fluctuation go up and down in coherent fashion across cortical networks, and that is very characteristic aspect of their behavior. So we have here a ubiquitous signal that happens all over the brain, happens spontaneously without any external instruction, and it is organized in networks. As I mentioned, the actually, surprisingly, despite the fact that there are thousands, literally thousands of studies of these resting tech fluctuations, we do not know what is the source, how are they generated. It is obvious now that they are a, a network phenomena, they emerge out of interaction with the neuron. They are very robust and basic phenomena. They can emerge even in tissue culture. If you just let the neurons connect to each other, they spontaneously start generate this video here, courtesy of Menachem Segal at the Weizmann Institute knows, they emerge spontaneously. It is a very, very robust phenomenon. It's not only seen with bold, you see it with all modalities. For example, here, work with Yuval Nir and it's hard feed. You see single neurons that were recorded in patients, in a patient on both sides of the hemisphere in the auditory cortex during quiet period when there was no uh, stimulus delivered to the patient. You see here the firing rate fluctuation of these neurons, some from the left hemisphere and some from the, from the right hemisphere. You see again the phenomena, there are very, very slow fluctuations of firing rate. They are correlated, they are networked, so they go together up and down, even though they are across the two sides of the, of the brain, they go up and down together and they emerge spontaneously. This is auditory cortex, in a totally quiet environment. So we have here robust phenomena that emerge spontaneously and occurs all over the place. Another important aspect that is relevant to free behavior that is the fact, and that's sort of the topic of thousands of studies, and that is that these networks, how strong they are connected, in other words, how coherent they are in their fluctuation, who is connected to whom and by what strength, actually, actually reflect, uh, I'm not sure, I, I don't know if anybody is asking questions, I hear some noise. Uh, um, they reflect the, a lot of the information we have about the person. For example, they reflect personality traits, they reflect habitual activation of the cortex in natural life. These are all studies from our group, but there are literally thousands of other studies showing that these networks and how they're connected, resting state fluctuation, reflect a lot of knowledge that the person has when it's facing the, the world. So these networks and, and activations are not some stupid noise. They are highly informative about the knowledge acquired by individual uh, during their daily life. So what is the hypothesis I would like to propose? <clears throat> I would like to propose that these resting state fluctuations I was describing are actually the mechanism that drive us to come up with a free and creative ideas. And the idea is very simple. Let's say you are supposed to come up with a name of a tool, then the network that involved with coming up with names of tools fluctuating randomly in a resting state manner, reflecting the knowledge you have about the tools, and occasionally such a fluctuation will cross, uh, will become high, either because of random stochastic uh, noise or because it hit a correct answer. And this exploration will lead to a wave of activity that will cross, cross a decision threshold and then you'll come up with the word, ah, screwdriver. So basically we have under the hood an exploration process that goes all the time. And these are the resting time fluctuation. When such a fluctuation goes up and crosses a threshold, you come up with the idea. 
just so it will not sound completely far-fetched, and for those of you who are familiar with networks and optimization solution and so forth, this is actually a mechanism very well known in network research called stochastic, rest, uh, stochastic search or stochastic optimization, where you use noise to explore the landscape of possible solutions and to get into a better, more optimal solution. So the idea is very simple. Every time we want to come up with a fresh, free idea, we use the random fluctuation, the stochastic fluctuation of the resting state to drive our ability to explore the landscape and come up with the idea. So this is the hypothesis. Now, how, how can I test this kind of hypothesis experimentally? And how can I um, sort of see what are the predictions that come up with this idea? One prediction that is very, very simple uh, is derived from the fact that I mentioned that the resting state fluctuations are very slow. They have slow dynamics. They take seconds. If the argument is that every time you have a free idea, you must be driven by the resting state fluctuation, there is a very simple prediction derived from it, and that is that before any time you come up with an idea, there must be a wave of resting state fluctuation, slow wave that leads you up to this idea. So we would expect that every time we are studying free behavior, to see this wave of the resting state coming up, driving the idea that we have. So let's explore scientifically during experiment and see if this prediction is correct. And the first experiment I want to, to tell you is a rather old experiment I conducted with Agar Gelbas again, so it's hard to read, when we recorded single neurons in the brains of patients that were uh, involved in free recall. It's an aspect of free behavior, but instead of, uh, for example, recalling names of tools, you are now recalling images of videos that you saw in the session previously that we call viewing session. So basically, the experiment is very simple. The patient is sitting in front of the screen, is viewing many, many videotapes, short clips of different um, famous people, scenes, and so forth, while we are recording single neurons in the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex of this patient. Then there is their free, uh, this is deterministic control, there is no control of the patient, it is being driven by the stimulus. But here comes the critical experiment. The patient is placed in front of a dark screen and he's simply asked to freely recall the videotape that he saw before during the viewing session and to speak into a microphone and tell the name of the video clip that he remembers. So now this is a free behavior because remember, we don't tell him specifically what video to remember, just in general, recall any uh, video you saw before. And let's see what happens in the brain of such a patient. We are recording a single neuron just before the patient comes up with the, with the video, with the recollection of the video that drove this neuron in the previous viewing session. And you can see that exactly as the prediction model or hypothesis uh, suggests, we see fluctuation. This is the firing rate of this neuron. It's a single neuron. At this moment, the patient freely recalled the video that this neuron is selected for. You see that prior to the, to the recalling, there is this uh, fluctuation, but it does not cross the decision threshold, the reporting threshold. But here we have a wave that is slightly larger. It is crossing the threshold, and you see the patient at this moment is saying, aha, I recalled in this case what the Simpson was. Okay. So you see that this fits precisely our suggestion, but you can, of course, argue, well, maybe this is just a coincidence. You can pick up a single neuron. So let's see what happens in the average, in the group of all the neurons that recorded, just before the patient came up with the name of the video for this, for which the neurons were uh, selected. Here you see the response during the viewing session, beautiful response of the neurons to the optimal um, video, and almost no response on the video. Here is the crucial uh, recall, free recall period. This is the time when a patient said, aha, I remember now the video. Notice this wave of activity anticipating by three seconds the moment of recall. Now you might ask, where is the fluctuation that I told you about 
uh, prior to this, here is the problem. Because these are spontaneous fluctuations, if you average all the neurons, they average out, and all you remain with is the average response leading to the free behavior. I hope this, this is clear. This fits nicely with the idea that the resting state fluctuation that occurred in these neurons was leading and driving the free recall period. So this is an example from a study. I showed you an example of a study of free recall of video images. Here I want to show, to show you that this phenomena exactly with the same characteristic occurs also during creative idea generation. I said that creation, creativity and originality are an aspect of free behavior. The question is, when you are creative, do you need a very specialized mechanism you are, or you are again using the same resting state fluctuation I told you about to drive your creative idea generation? So here is an experiment in creativity, again done by Rottenburg Dave Veer. It has the structure that I told you before, subject lies in the magnet, gets an instruction, but this time it's an instruction in alternative use of common objects. Come up with creative ideas, what you can do with a button. So you line the magnet and you occasionally say, ah, make a necklace. And maybe use it for checkerboard pieces. And every time, uh, and we are following your brain activation during this idea generation. Every time you come up with idea, you also press a button. We have the time at which you came up with this free creative idea. And again, just like we saw with this thing in neurons, this is both fMRI. You see a very nice buildup starting before the time of of a report that is driving in a slow uh, dynamics the moment of creative idea generation with the same dynamics of free recall of so we see the same phenomena also involved in single units and uh, we also see it interestingly in the magnet we are following the pupil dilation as the subject come up with the free ideas or free names or creative ideas, and we compare them to the control task where they have to repeat exactly the same word again and again. And you can see again nicely that the pupils start dilating. We know the dilation of the pupil is associated with cognitive engagement, with the um, sort of arousal uh, or cognitive demand. And we can see just like in the single neurons and bold, before the free, behavior, we see this anticipatory buildup of dilation of the pupil across all uh, different tasks. These are two uh, creativity tasks. You see beautiful anticipatory buildup before the subject came up with the idea and in the coming up with names of different objects. Again, you see buildup and contrast it with a control experiment where the buildup is right when the subject have to stay there. So again, we see this phenomenon of buildup, and perhaps most interesting to show how robust and how diverse this buildup is, is that uh, recent work that Itzik Norman in our lab has done, recording what are called subwave uh, ripples, and these are phenomena that you record in the hippocampus, which are perhaps the most dramatic synchronized events that happen in the brain. These are phenomena where you have within about 100 milliseconds, we estimated about 2 million neurons firing a spike at the same time. So imagine it's, a, it's such a vastly synchronized phenomena that you can sort of simulate it in your mind by imagining a stadium with 2 million people that clap their hand at the same within 100 milliseconds. It is an enormous uh, synchronized event. And the question is, <clears throat> Is there a change in the frequency of these sharp wave ripples also during uh, <clears throat> free recall? And free recall. <clears throat> so, uh, Itzik did an experiment that was roughly similar to what I told you with uh, Hagar Gelbar Sagir. Patient lies in the air, uh, uh, lies in bed, is being recorded. This time, these are not single neurons, but these ripples, this massive synchronized event in the hippocampus while watching images of different content faces places and so forth and then he is asked again uh, eyes closed and also a block uh, to freely recall the images this time these are pictures 
that he saw a few minutes ago uh, during the picture video. And let's see what happens to this time, not neurons, not bone, but the frequency of the sharp wave ripples that it's massive synchronized event. And I want to show you a movie that, uh, that Itzik prepared to illustrate this, what happens um, uh, during this uh, recall. So here you have a subject that is recalling a picture of the White House. He is, by the way, speaking into a microphone and describing his inner experience. What you see here in yellow are the ripples. We hear them also. Now he's recalling a picture of some famous uh, musician. Notice to the ripples relative to the time of recall. Now she recalls. Every sort of wave that you hear is two million neurons firing in synchrony. So I hope you noticed the very striking phenomenon. The ripples always, or most of the time, not always, but most of the time anticipated by a, by a second or two, the free uh, emergence of the picture in the mind of the patient. And now by doing it the average uh, ripple rate, we can see it clearly. So this is what happened during picture viewing. What happened during picture viewing that some pictures elicit high ripple rate, we call them the optimal pictures for this recording and other pictures actually suppress the ripple fire. So this is what happened during picture viewing. Now let's see what happens when you are freely recalling these images. If you recall the images that belong to the set that drove optimally the ripples, you can see an increase in ripple rate, but critically, this increase is leading to the recall. It's not during the recall, but it is anticipating it. Again, you can imagine really fluctuating resting state that is sort of building up and then leading you to recall. And this happens only, it's a very selective phenomenon. It happens only for the optimal images. It does not happen for the normal. So to, summarize, <clears throat> to summarize this part of the talk, I showed you and there are additional examples, I'll mention them in a second, that under all diverse conditions, Whenever there is free behavior involved, we see in the brain a slow buildup of about a second, half a second, two seconds that is preceding the free event. We never see such buildup before a controlled deterministic event. The, the buildup is found across different tasks, in single units, in a local field potential. I didn't show you that, but we have this data. In bold, in the uh, ripples, it was shown also in EEG studies, the famous um, readiness potential that uh, you may have heard, uh, and also was suggested to play a role uh, in uh, to reflect spontaneous activity by Aaron Sugar. I want to mention his theoretical uh, indication that we are sort of expanding on. All these are uh, evidence that are signatures, you might call, of a free behavior. So we have here a very robust, diverse and consistent uh, observation. In fact, I have not encountered yet uh, any free behavior that fits my operational definition of free behavior that is not preceded by a slowly buildup of signals. So that can be said as a very strong test of the of the report. So this prediction fits with the hypothesis that these slowly fluctuating resting state uh, signals are actually driving free behavior. But you might, might correctly argue that, that maybe this is just a coincidence. We have two phenomena, 
a slow buildup coming up before free behavior and a slow fluctuation of the resting state, and I'm forcibly joining them together without any real justification, except these very, very few cases that the signal to noise is so high that you can actually see the sort of resting state fluctuation leading to them. So how can we prove that there is a question? Yeah, just a oh, question. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Just a question about, uh, you know, labeling it as an idea. Is it possible that it's the preparation of speech, of reporting, uh, that, that can drive all these phenomena that you showed? Just well, the preparation for more, even the motto preparation or the attentional preparation? Yes, very good question. The thing is that this uh, activity that I showed you is always localized to the representation that is actually representing the phenomena. So for example, if we are talking about names of tools, we will find them in the language area on the left side of the brain in the areas. I didn't talk about the neuroanatomy and we don't find them in the motor. Even when you are doing a decision to move, like a classic studies in, uh, in EEG, VBET experiment and all that, uh, you don't find them in the motor, proper motor system. You always find these buildups in the pre-motor system, again suggesting that it is not merely the motor preparation, but it is more a uh, sort of an abstract uh, phenomenon that is leading to the motor. So, um, so how, how can I tie this buildup to the resting state? It occurred to us to take advantage of the fact that different individuals have different resting state fluctuation dynamics. What do I mean by that? We find when we look at resting state fluctuations that some individuals might have them moving up and down in a slow manner. See here, the slope of the, of the buildup is very slow. This is resting state without doing any task, just lying in the magnet and being rest. Other participants might have a more fast going up and down fluctuation. If my hypothesis is correct, and the buildup is actually a wave of the resting state, there is a very strong prediction. It says that participants that have slow fluctuations in the resting state should also have a slow buildup of activity prior to the free behavior, and participants that have fast fluctuations in the resting state should have fast buildup. This can be tested. You can have participants show, uh, you can examine in the fMRI, for example, Resting state fluctuation of participants. Measure the dynamic, how fast they go up and down, and see if it correlates to the buildup that you find before free and creative behaviors. This is precisely what Rotem did. And you see here a nice correlation between the slope of the buildup. This is the buildup that we find before the free behavior that I showed you, and the slope of the resting state fluctuations. And you see that across individual subjects, got here is a subject, you see a nice correlation. Very, very importantly, this is not some kind of artifact of fMRI, because if you look at the control, the same network, the same individuals, you look at the control state where they are supposed to simply say the word again and again and again, and you don't see, you see uh, the correlation is significantly drops down. So it's a phenomenon specific for the buildup relating to free behavior. We find it in, in the other two conditions as well. So we see here a nice correlation which links together the free behavior and the uh, resting state fluctuation. Now, you remember probably that I said, and you know, probably those who are familiar, the resting state is all over the brain, includes all networks. So if what I'm telling you is that the resting state fluctuations are driving your free behavior, you might say, why aren't we jumping up and down on the, on the chair all the time and coming up all the time with the words and all that freely? What is controlling the resting state and preventing it from intruding into our behavior? Obviously, the brain has a mechanism that can control the free fluctuation, resting state fluctuation, and prevent them from initiating. It is even more precise than that. Imagine that I ask you to come up with, the, with images of famous people. 
So you will come up with images of Clinton, of Obama, of DiCaprio and so forth. But even though I'm allowing you free coming up with names, you will never come up with the name of uh, the, with an image of the Eiffel Tower or very rarely or the Tower of Pisa. So I can tell you to freely behave, but your brain is able to delineate very carefully the arena in which you allow freedom to operate. In other words, you can restrict your freedom to specific domains with very ease and very flex uh, high flexibility. How does the brain does it? This is a, a, a question that, again, Itzik Norman addressed in his study. This time we are recording a cortical activity, local field potential, and he basically modified the experiment I told you before, where the patient was viewing images. This time he was viewing images of faces, famous faces and famous places, but was asked, and this is the trick here, was asked to recall freely either the faces in one session or the places in another session. And when you watch the behavior, you see that when, when you are asked, as I said, to recall faces, you will easily come up with names of faces or images of faces you saw before, but you will rarely mention a place. Vice versa, if I ask you to recall the places that you saw, you can very easily and flexibly move to recall face places, but you will not be intruding and recalling faces. So how does it happen in the brain? It found a very interesting phenomenon. He found that the brain has the ability to reduce, so to you can metaphorically say, to cool down the networks that are associated with the, un, uh, with the unimportant element, the elements you don't want to freely recall, and enhance the excitation, the general excitation, the baseline excitation for those uh, contents that you want to freely recall. So for example, when the patient were asked to recall faces, and you look what happens in the cortical representation of faces, there are cortical representations that are selected to faces, not to places, you, you see that throughout the period of recalling the faces, the general excitability of these neurons was enhanced. This, of course, has the impact of bringing the, the activity closer to the threshold, so the resting chest fluctuation can more easily, spontaneously cross the decision threshold and allow you to come up with names of faces. By contrast, the, the, whenever you're trying to record the places, the brain reduces the excitability of these networks that are dedicated to faces, and in that way prevents the face uh, sort of recall to penetrate and intrude onto uh, the, the, the response when you're trying to recall things. And the opposite happens when you are doing recording in a place selective region. It is enhanced in general, manner. the baseline is brought closer to the threshold when you're recalling places, but when you're trying to recall faces, the brain generally, generally cools down these networks and prevents them this way get into uh, the threshold. And you see again here, you're trying to recall faces in the face selective area, you see enhanced general activation and reduce for places. So we have here a very elegant mechanism that allows the brain to selectively decide which arena you want to be free and in which arena you want to be quiet. Another interesting phenomenon that Itzik found is that when you are trying to be creative and come up with a free record, for example, you are able to enhance the amplitude of the resting state fluctuation specifically in the network that is doing the free record. So if you are trying to come up with images of faces, you will be enhancing the amplitude. You see here the power, uh, power spectrum difference between the recall when you're trying to recall something and just rest. And you see that the slow fluctuations are enhanced in the amplitude whenever you're trying to recall. So the brain is sort of increasing the fluctuations and by that enhancing the exploration it allows you to come up with the idea. Now, so far I talked about free behavior, but it is interesting to consider what happens in the brain when you're trying to do the opposite. 
let's imagine you are trying very, very carefully to shoot into a specific target. In other words, you want to reduce all the spontaneous behavior and be completely focused on your target. And in that case, the spontaneous fluctuations actually are interfering with your performance. Or imagine that you are watching a screen of a, of a computer and I'm telling you that for a very, very brief period, there will be a very blurred image. You have to tell whether it's a face or just random noise. And I'm making the image very uh, tricky or very noisy, so it will be a difficult task. You have very, very short time to respond. In that case, you have to be totally focused on the stimulus that comes out from the outside world, and it is goes against your strategy, it makes you maladaptive if you are behaving freely and spontaneously because you will miss the, the you'll miss the target. And Rotem Bodet Vir did this experiment. It looks sounds very complicated, but in fact it's very simple. This is an fMRI, fMRI experiment, subject line, the magnet. They are being, uh, the, the task during some, what we call attended block, is that they, will, they have to attend the screen. There will be a very, very short presentation of a noisy image. They have to press a button, a one button if it's a face, and another button if it's a, it's a noise. The trick here is that occasionally, in about 10% of the, of the times, no stimulus appears on the screen. The subject is fully attentive, is ready to pre press a button, but nothing appears. So this blank screen. In as a sort of a counterpart to this uh, attend block, uh, Rotem ran what we call passive block, where having exactly the same stimuli, but this time the subject is not supposed to do anything. Just stare, relax, and stare passively at the, at the, the screen. Notice that in terms of the stimuli, uh, both, both, uh, both uh, attended and passive blocks are exactly identical. And the question is, how does the brain uh, prepare during the attended block and how can it sort of make, become focused on the target compared to the passive block? And what uh, Rotten found, in the relevant area, these are visual areas, sort of um, um, eye movement and attention areas, she found a very, very striking, uh, two, two striking phenomena. First of all, paradoxically, you might think, the baseline is increased during the attendant block. You might say this is completely counterintuitive. By bringing the baseline higher, you're bringing the noise closer to the threshold and you're making uh, more trouble and, and more, um, wrong decisions for the subject, but it also enhances the sensitivity to the target by making the, the tissue more excite, excitable and ready to respond, you have your reaction time faster and you can respond faster. So you see the baseline is, is enhanced during the attend period and reduced during the passive. The critical difference that allows the subject to perform well is the fact that the brain knows how to quench the amplitude of the resting state fluctuation in this network. So when you are attending carefully and ready to respond, the fluctuations go below, the amplitude of the fluctuation is reduced compared to the time when you are passively doing, doing the, the target. So the trick of the brain is as follows. In order to become more sensitive, you enhance the baseline, just like you are doing in baseline free behavior, but the trick is that while in free behavior, you are enhancing the amplitude of the resting state fluctuations, here you are quenching them. And by that, you are increasing the signal to noise, and getting an optimal performance. I hope this is clear. Now, let's assume this goes to an extreme and you have subjects that are un incapable of reducing or quenching the resting state fluctuations to sufficient degree during a control time. If all the story I was telling you is correct, then this subject should suffer because they will have spontaneous intrusive behaviors that disrupt the control response to the, to the target. Remember, here we are talking about the opposite of free behavior. We are talking about completely controlled behavior and how the resting state fluctuations might actually interfere and disrupt this behavior. 
And this uh, study was conducted by Shani Grossman in my lab. A very simple experiment. Uh, it's called one back visual task. You are, you are, th this time it was done in patients, preferential recording, recording in the cortex. The patient is watching a computer screen on which different images of different categories appear. Occasionally, two images, uh, an image will repeat twice, and then the patient has to pay, uh, press a button. It sounds to you a completely trivial experiment. In fact, it's not so easy. It requires a lot of attention because some of the images, although they are different, look a bit similar. It's also a prolonged experiment. You have to keep your attention carefully on the screen. If you miss it, you'll be missing the target and not performing. And now what Shani noticed, and that led to the whole experiment, that in the visual system, um, you find patients that have uh, some patients that have during rest without doing any task naturally they have very very slow uh, weak fluctuation in the visual system they're sort of you might say naturally quiet brains you have here examples from few such patients you see that they have very few fluctuation these are all done on the same scale on the other hand you have a group of patients show very wide fluctuation in the activity during rest without any task spontaneously emerging in the visual system. So Shani asked a very simple question. Maybe these patients that have this very large fluctuation cannot suppress them well enough so they will interrupt, uh, interfere with their ability to maintain their attention during the one back visual test. So basically she made a very simple prediction. Those patients with high fluctuations during rest, not during doing the task, will have lower performance com compared to these patients who are naturally quiet and they don't have this disruptive rest of the process. This is exactly what she found. In the SAS related contacts, in other words, those contacts that are selected to the visual system and the system that is involved in performing the task, there was a negative correlation between the performance of the subject and the uh, fluctuations of the resting state fluctuation measured sometimes even days before they perform the task. It's sort of a natural trait of an individual to have a quiet brain and then perform highly demanding attentional tasks uh, compared to individ individuals who have high fluctuation and perform them. And this was selective to the network that is doing the task we found electrodes that were not activated during the task that didn't show this. So to summarize my entire story, I want I showed you several uh, experimental findings. The first one is that you find a slow buildup of activation, which seems to be a signature of all free behaviors, no matter what uh, measurement modality you have, single unit local field potential, bold fMRI, ripples, and even pupil diameter. We find, and that is critical to the hypothesis, similar dynamics across individuals <clears throat> in the resting state when they are not doing any tasks, they're not doing any, uh, any uh, performance, specific to the networks that are involved in the free behavior we're measuring, and the anticipatory buildup <clears throat> that we see in this network prior to the free um, idea, free behavior or creative behavior. We argue and we show data that the boundary of free behavior, free behaviors are not totally anarchic. You don't just jump up and down and doing and emitting all kinds of uncontrollable behaviors. Free behavior is very well structured and very well delineated. And we argue that this delineation is set up by the brain by using baseline shift, by increasing or reducing the excitability of the tissue that is relevant to the task, you allow it to express behavior or reduce its ability to express such behavior. And I showed you that if we want to be in the opposite domain, if you want to be totally controlled, you want to be totally focused on an external task, not something spontaneous from inside, the resting state fluctuations actually disrupt those tasks and the brain tries as best as it can to quench those fluctuations. All these data and all these ideas converge on the hypothesis 
that this resting state fluctuation that we were studying for so many years, and we actually did not know if they have any function, actually play a critical and important role and constitute a universal brain mechanism that try, drives all our ability to behave freely and have creative and I want to thank the, the students that, uh, that actually made all these discoveries, Rotem Bodeitville, Itzik Norman, Shani Grossman, and Michal Arel is the head of them. Thank you. And if you have a question, I'll be happy to answer. So the, um, thank you very much for the talk and the talk is open for questions. So I suggest uh, since we can see all of us simultaneously that the person that they uh, ask uh, present himself uh, before like name and go on. Hi, Rafi. Yes. This is uh, Alon and yes. thank you very much for this uh, stimulating talk. Um, I have many questions, but what comes into my mind is basically if your data suggests that there is no free behavior. Why? Because it seems like that all the information is already basically built or, or seeded in your brain before you can come up with a free, uh, with a free behavior, right? So it's not really free behavior, it's something that is already um, Trigger your brain at some point, you know, even if it was, uh, um, you know, uh, something that you did in purpose or something that, did, that your brain captured, you know, somewhere. But this information is some sort of basically sitting in your brain, and your really, really is coming up from this information that is circulating in the brain. And the second thing is whether, you know, meditation is something that basically really you know, reduce this spontaneous fluctuations that you were speaking about? Uh, two very interesting questions. The first one is very important, and, and I, I agree partially with what you said. In other words, I will say the following, and let's focus on creativity, because I think this is really the possible. You can never be creative without prior knowledge. So imagine uh, music, okay? Uh, I am not familiar with music theory and I'm not a musician. I'll never be able to come up with creative ideas or creative symphony. What's out on the other hand, before he started even creating all this amazing work, had embedded and incorporated what you might call an intuition or a database on which his creativity could operate. So I completely agree with you that there must be an element of learning, knowledge, incorporation before you come up with a creative idea. However, the specific construct, the specific exemplar with which you come up could be a, a sort of unexpected conjunction of several items in your database that somehow being uh, through the resting state, through this noisy exploration of the terrain, suddenly come up with a combination that nobody thought about it. The, the metaphor I have in mind is evolution, where you have all these mutations that are checking different possibilities and, you know, natural selection is picking up one. You can imagine this, this uh, noisy fluctuation as kind of a mechanism to, to bring you up with fresh combinations that were not in your original data set that you incorporated. The data set is indeed we actually know where it is, and I mentioned it in the introduction, it is embedded in the nature of the connectivity in the new, among the neurons that are expressing the resting state of person. Now, what was your, your second question? I forgot. It was related to the, the impact meditation. of meditation on spontaneous actuation. Yes, fascinating. We actually did a study on meditation, and we think we see a baseline shift during meditation, it is reducing in the default mode network. And actually most of the brain is reducing the excitability level in the brain. And that might reduce the spontaneous uh, sort of decision or we call it ignition of different thoughts. And my, maybe this how you reach into the state of clear mind that the meditators 
speak about. By the way, we found that you can reach this state very easily by simply repeating a mantra. We actually have a nice study about it with uh, Aviva Berkovich Ohana. We're just repeating the same word again and again and again, mimics many of these baseline shifts that are supposed to be found in meditation. Okay, great. Thanks. More questions? So, Rafi, I have um, one question. My name is Yaniv from uh, Hi, Yaniv. Department of Brain and Cognition. And um, regarding this selection and, uh, and this uh, experiment of elaborating this free behavior, so uh, in this sense, would you expect that, uh, that if we would record one single neuron in the hippocampal uh, gyrus or in the hilus or in the in CA1, would we get the same results in this case? Well, I showed you the first uh, experimental result I showed you were recording from the hippocampus of single neurons during free record. And I showed you that in fact, the place where we see the closest or more direct uh, sort of manifestation of our hypothesis is in single neurons activity in the hippocampus, where you see fluctuations, before, during the exploratory period, and the sort of the buildup, and then the, the free recall. However, in this patient, we did not record resting tech fluctuations proper without doing anything. Uh, although, you know, in the hippocampus, it's difficult to say what is resting state because you constantly think about things and so forth. So, uh, we do have data in the hippocampus showing both in single neurons. And even more fascinating with this burst of called ripples, that the same build up and the same sort of hypothesis holds. Thanks. Rafi, may I ask a question? Sure, sure, feel free. Hi, I'm I'm Ori from Philosophy of Mind. Um, I I have a follow up on Alon's question, also about the way you're interpreting your results. Uh, I'm wondering whether uh, we are actually talking about creativity and freedom. I mean, I'm imagining a mathematician trying to prove a theorem or a surgeon trying to carry out a very complex surgical task. It seems like they're being spontaneous and free in everything they're doing. Nobody's forcing them to do anything. Um, but those types of tasks are not the types of tasks that you looked at. The types of tasks that you looked at were just tasks where subject behavior is unplanned or unexpected to the, by the subject. So I'm wondering whether your results are, are really terrific results, but just results about unplanned behavior rather than uh, creative or, uh, or free behavior. Sure, it's a legitimate question. Of course, you know, we are constrained by, uh, by experimental uh, constraints. You cannot I cannot put a doctor that tries to solve a problem in a magnet for a week and then it comes. But I want to make two points. First of all, we did actually test creativity and not just unexpected behavior. We asked, for example, and we took this creative task, you know, I'm not a cognitive scientist, we picked them directly from the most conventional test for creativity that you do when you want to find whether somebody is creative. For example, this uh, alternative use uh, task, I give you, I say, a balloon. You now come up with creative ideas of, of uh, what you can do with a balloon apart from... So, so this is uh, our attempt, and what we found is that exactly the same mechanism operates when you are more creative and when you are indeed doing just something unexpected. Another point I want to make that it's not true that a doctor or a scientist or anybody creative is operating in a completely spontaneous manner. The, the trick that I personally found, many of you probably will have the same experiment, the typical case is that you have a problem that is bothering you. You try to solve it, you try to solve it, nothing comes out, and you say, okay, I'll sleep on it, or forget about it, and suddenly, out of the blue, a response comes. Uh, completely, you know, and, and, and the, my argument would be that what probably happened in the brain is that the, the fact that the problem bothered you caused your brain to raise the excitability level in the network of 
that contained information, let's say it was a, a scientific question, so be the knowledge base of scientific knowledge, the excitability was right there. You went did something else, but the fluctuation went on and on until the right combination came up, it came up with the solution. Now you are right that we did not, and I don't know how to test it uh, experimentally, we tried to do a model system, and uh, as all model system might be missing the sense of that. Thank you. Okay, since... Uh, More questions? It was nice, it was nice, uh, it was nice uh, meeting you, and I hope uh, we'll meet in uh, healthier times. Thank yes, you. sure. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you. you had uh, 63 participants uh, oh. hearing fascinated uh, the lecture. So yeah. thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, thank, you. thank you.